so they will be available. <laughs> they will be available. Um, as a, just a brief introduction, um, I'm going to read your introduction, Anna. Uh, Dr. Anna Mills is an associate professor and licensed clinical psychologist in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab at VCU. She specializes in neuropsychological evaluations and rehabilitation psychotherapy for individuals with acquired neurological disorders such as TBI, stroke, epilepsy. In addition to clinical care, Dr. Mills' work focuses on promoting health equity, diversity, and inclusion in the healthcare environment. So, the um, uh, do you have? Uh, can I? Can you pull up your? Yep, your, I um, do have okay. slides, and what I'm going to do is just share my screen and then transfer the slides over. All right, you're able to, uh, oh, let's go all the way back to the beginning there. No one wants to jump in. There we go. Excellent. So we are going to talk about managing stress uh, through relaxation and mindfulness practice in brain injury rehabilitation. And frankly, it, this is something that is so useful for all of us. Uh, these are tools that I focus on in working with pretty much all of the individuals, regardless of what's bringing them in, whether it's stroke, TBI, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, mild cognitive impairment, or dementia. I almost always focus very early on when I'm working with someone on managing stress and developing their relaxation skills. So this is nice that uh, we can actually really have a good conversation here amongst ourselves. Um, want to get just a sense of people's level of comfort in using relaxation skills for yourself. So scale of zero to 10, um, how comfortable do you feel familiar with practicing basic relaxation and mindfulness skills? You can drop it in the chat or unmute yourself. I would say for myself, I would be about an eight or a nine. Um, especially the, uh, you know, there are certain, certain other strategies I could probably use much more than others, but yes. <laughs> Okay, so, so pretty high and about an eight or a nine tells us that you've got lots of skills and there's some area to develop. Excellent. Anyone else? Your level of comfort in practicing this for yourself. I would probably ditto Christine. Excellent. So that's really gonna help you when it comes to teaching these practices that you've already got a strong foundation for yourself. Now, if you don't, that's okay because we're gonna build on it. So now I wanna do a slightly different rating. How would you rate your level of confidence in teaching relaxation skills and basic mindfulness practice to other people? Teaching, I will go lower. I'm not comfortable with teaching. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. Um, probably closer to a five or a four. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. We are going to definitely bump that up by the time we wrap up today. So let's start with just a little bit of practice for ourselves. Uh, our breathing is such an integral part of our bodily experience and our mental experience. So I'm going to invite you all to join me in a brief mindfulness moment. If you're not already sitting comfortably, just take a moment to put yourself in a nice relaxed position. Uh, particularly important to have your back supported, perhaps even your neck supported. Allow your hands to just rest gently on your legs or the arms of your chair. You might also allow your gaze to rest gently downward, or if you feel comfortable, you could close your eyes. 
I find it easier to focus when my eyes are closed. And just gently bring your attention to your breath. Taking note of what it feels like as you breathe in and out. You don't need to change anything about your breath. Just take note of the sensations of breathing. You might notice where in your body you feel it, your nose, your mouth, or your chest. You might notice other physical sensations, emotions, or thoughts. And take a moment longer. And when you're ready, you can shift your attention back outward into the space around you. Congratulations on shifting <laughs> your brain and your body with a brief practice. We're going to dive into how that works and what it's really doing for us. So what we're going to cover today, a little bit about the basic scientific evidence for relaxation and mindfulness-based skills in brain injury rehab. We're going to cover a basic curriculum for teaching these skills to others. Uh, we're going to practice two different types of skills, and you're going to be able to identify at least five, probably 15 different resources for teaching relaxation and mindfulness skills to other people. I will share my slides with Christine, and she will share them with you. There are a number of embedded links in the slides that are going to help you to supplement running a relaxation group. So this is typically what a basic curriculum looks like when I'm guiding a person or a group of people like we did just now. I almost always start with a practice of breath because nothing helps people really appreciate what this is like actually doing it and feeling it in their body. Sometimes it can be a little difficult. It might even sound a little woo-woo when we talk about mindfulness. So helping them connect concepts with bodily experiences is a really strong way to start off. Uh, then I like to really lean into a little bit of education and alternating education with practice, education with practice. So I typically talk just a bit about stress, how it impacts our body and what our fight flight response is. We don't have to go into great detail about this. We all probably know quite a bit through our own lived experience. And then I talk a little bit about how stress and brain injury interact with each other, how we can monitor stress, and then going into actual individual practices. And so you as group leaders can really select what you wanna use, how deep you wanna go. Um, this type of curriculum can span over several different meetings if you want to go into more detail, or it could all be done in a single hour meeting. So a little bit about stress and the body. Uh, we all know what it's like to be stressed. Raise your hand. You've been stressed before <laughs> in your life. <laughs> So stress is an absolutely natural response to a difficult situation. And that situation can either be external, like uh, someone cuts us off when we're driving, or it can be internal in our body, like having a memory can create stress. And our bodies are naturally evolved to automatically respond to a stress by engaging in our fight 
or flight response. Um, now this is a slightly simplistic explanation. So if you were going to spend more time exploring this, you could always talk more about fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, which are other aspects of stretch responses. But I find at the least when I'm educating someone, I wanna talk about the two, fight or flight. And so this stress response causes a whole cascade of physical experiences in our body. Um, I also find that just educating people on how our bodies change in response to stress goes a really long way in helping them make sense of the changes that they're noticing in their own body. For example, explaining how stress right, gives us tunnel vision, how we might get ringing in our ears, a racing heart, labored breathing, sweaty palms, dry mouth. Um, in extreme situations, people might actually be incontinent. They might pee themselves. That's because the stress response triggers our bladder to relax. Essentially, it's our body saying we've got to let go of any extra weight that's going to hold us back from either fleeing or fighting. So I like to go over some of these really basic biological processes. And it really does span from the tip of our head to our toes of uh, this stress response. Now, although we're made to respond to acute stress, human beings are not designed to respond to chronic stress. And this is where the trouble really starts for people. When we're faced with chronic stressors, like we are in our culture just naturally now, that fight and flight response starts to become overactivated. It's as if the volume gets turned all the way up. Um, and in some cases, the body and the brain essentially forgets to tune down that fight or flight response. And so what we get is a whole cascade of negative effects from an overactivated fight and flight response that impacts our mental health, our cognitive health, and our physical health. And I've cited some studies. If you really want to dive deeper down the rabbit hole, these are some uh, systematic analyses and meta analyses on the impact of stress in the body. We know that it relates to anxiety, depression irritability and other mental health concerns. Chronic overactivated stress contributes to subjective cognitive problems like uh, brain fog, inattention, slow processing, difficulty with decision-making, forgetfulness. Now, fortunately, these changes are transient. Typically, when we lower our stress, those kinds of issues tend to improve. But chronic stress also has a huge long-term impact on physical health. It's related to greater fluctuations in blood pressure, greater likelihood of developing diabetes, uh, pain conditions like chronic pain, headaches, vestibular issues like dizziness. There's a connection between our brain and our gut. So we often see gut issues, um, inflammation, gut distress with chronic stress kidney problems, liver problems, cardiac problems, and actually in extreme conditions of stress, we can see people develop cardiac arrhythmias. And although it's very, very rare to actually die from stress, it does happen. I don't usually cover that with uh, a group when I'm working on because I don't wanna stoke fear, but I think it is helpful for your own education to appreciate what a stress response looks like from relatively benign to extreme. Um, and if you all do have questions, feel free to just dive in. Uh, I might not see the chat. So Christina, if you are monitoring the chat, that would help. I am. Mm -hmm. All right, so stress and TBI, this is really a synergistic and bi-directional relationship. We know that brain injury contributes to stress, and stress, in turn, impacts brain injury and brain injury recovery. Um, so sustaining a brain injury, either directly as a result of injury to the brain or a host of other factors related to the accident that caused the brain injury, that creates a brand new number of stressors. 
right? People can't work, can't drive, lose friends, um, have symptoms. So it's like doubling, tripling, quadrupling the amount of stress that someone's dealing with. Then it actually reduces somebody's stress tolerance. So perhaps if that person was used to operating at an eight out of 10 stress level, now they might struggle to operate at a lot of three out of 10 stress level. And in addition, often brain injury can challenge people's ability to use the coping tools that they're used to. For example, if they used to cope by exercise, they might have balance issues that then affect that ability. We also know that chronically elevated stress has a direct impact on the brain and that can be really long-term. Uh, it reduces neurogenesis, which is like the growth of the brain cells and neuroplasticity. It increases mood issues, which elevates stress, and it can really exacerbate TBI symptoms, um, issues like brain fog, dizziness, and insomnia. So what you get is kind of this nasty circle of stress and TBI. That's why it's really important to educate people on how they can manage stress. These are some resources. Again, the links are embedded here. Uh, so I like to sometimes give people some handouts to help educate them. That also serves as a memory aid uh, for people who might be struggling to retain information. The reading level on these is, I'm gonna say probably written at about like a sixth or eighth grade level. It's fairly accessible information. When I am calling through resources, I'm really kind of keeping in mind that many of the people who I work with do have some cognitive issues. So I like to select things that are relatively straightforward and easy to understand. So I often start off with just teaching people how to measure their stress temperature. And a simple tool like this, a very simple visual aid works really well. This is a stress thermometer. And so people can rate themselves. You can check in, have everybody kind of take their temperature at the start of a meeting and then at the the end of the meeting and see how did that temperature change as you've gone through learning about stress management skills. I also will sometimes include some information on identifying stress triggers because that's a super simple way of managing stress is trying to avoid what triggers you can and what triggers can't be avoided. Then you use your coping tools to lower your stress level. So what's helpful to know here is that if someone is at a five or higher, it is time to double down and use those coping skills to lower that stress level. Because the higher that stress level gets, quite literally, the harder it is for us to think and do. And so the harder it is to self-regulate and bring our stress level back down. So what is mindfulness? What are relaxation skills? Um, I will acknowledge that this is not an intensive tutorial strictly on mindfulness practice. Um, I typically combine mindfulness-informed, mindfulness-based skills with people who I'm working with, but these practices are not strictly um, in line with a, what we call like a classic mindfulness practice. I like to go a little rogue and just do whatever seems to work best for the people I'm working with. Um, but in short, mindfulness is the practice of being able to pay attention in a very specific way. Paying attention on purpose to the present moment and without judgment or self-criticism. That is such a key part because often when we pause and we tune into the moment and we check and see what's going on within us, we tend to get self-critical. We might be like, man, I shouldn't feel angry about this thing. So practicing that non-judgmental 
perspective is so important. Um, this quote is by John Cabot Zinn, who is a uh, clinical psychologist who has really promoted mindfulness practice. We can also think about mindfulness as being able to shift modes in our brain. We tend to live in thinking mode, ruminating mode, or doing mode. So practicing mindfulness and relaxation is shifting from thinking into sensing or observing. And there are a myriad of benefits of practicing mindfulness and other relaxation skills. It reduces anxiety and depression. It boosts our overall mood. It reduces chronic pain and headaches, lowers our blood pressure, lowers blood sugar fluctuations. It increases our immune system response. So we're less likely to become sick or catch a cold when we're practicing these skills. It increases our brain cell connections and our neuroplasticity, allowing us to enhance our thinking skills like attention, problem solving, creativity, uh, and other types of mental flexibility. I really like this image <laughs> because it's such a simple illustration of how we live in thinking mode with our mind full on the left-hand side versus being mindful. You notice this guy and the dog when they're being mindful, they're just being present and they're taking in what is around them. Now there's also really a robust body of research that's looked at the use of mindfulness and relaxation skills in brain injury recovery. And it, does immense uh, benefit for targeting the kind of triad of symptoms that people often have, the emotional or mental health issues, the cognitive issues, and the physical health issues. Um, and this, um, this study cited here was a systematic review looking at a number of other different studies found effectiveness for reducing depression, anxiety, PTSD, enhancing processing speed, attention and memory in individuals uh, living with TBI, even reducing physical symptoms. We might often think of physical symptoms as, as being kind of set and immutable, not being able to affect them, but uh, they can certainly be impacted. Uh, we can improve people's fatigue, their sleep, their dizziness, their headaches. These are some really good mindfulness resources to check out. The Therapist Aid, uh, if you're not familiar with Therapist Aid, it is a website. There's um, uh, free options and then there's subscription options. The ones that I've listed here are all available for free. You can click on that link and download it. Those sheets have basic relaxation tools, information on mindfulness, um, some mindfulness exercises to practice, um, the Kessler Foundation has a great series of podcasts on mindfulness meditation. Um, there's also a million good videos. Um, these are some links by uh, Dr. Sullivan on using guided meditation for people with a TBI. So I would say check out these links. Uh, go find other links that work for you. You don't have to be an expert in mindfulness in order to lead a group in it. You can utilize the resources that already exist out there. Uh, find a good video, provide a little information to the group in advance, and then you can just play the video and allow participants to follow along with a guided practice. Um, that will help you become a little bit more comfortable with doing this. So these types of practices also don't need to be super complex. I am 100% certain that each of you already has like a handful of simple strategies that you use in your own life to help you de-stress. 
you can absolutely recruit that when you're working with a group. We don't have to recreate the wheel here. Really common ones, exercise, can be low impact like aquatic therapy or chair stretching, um, yoga. Uh, you might've heard of the Love Your Brain yoga uh, practice, the Love Your Brain Foundation. This link also goes to a great series of post-concussion yoga videos. Uh, things like food, like eating your favorite food, making a meal can be relaxing, watching a funny movie, uh, telling a joke, anything to elicit laughter. Laughter actually releases oxytocin, which is right our happy hormone and happy chemical. Listening to relaxing music, hanging out with people who you like, um, art can be really helpful practice. This website, Artfulness, is actually curated by VCU, and they have a series of different guided practices for beginners, so you do not need to be an artist in order to practice the mindful art approaches. And then neurographic art is another really fascinating mindfulness practice, um, and if we have time today, we could go through some of that, but in brief, neurographic art it involves writing um, and just using a marker to create kind of free form, very gentle flowing lines, and then going back in and rounding off any edges or corners uh, to create uh, an image. It could be an abstract image or it could be a more structured image. Um, there's actually some really good evidence that shows that neurographic art can enhance our frontal lobe uh, functioning. It increases our attention and it reduces our stress levels. And this is a great video that walks people through how to do neurographic art. And you see at the bottom here, two minute stress relievers. This is a sheet on very brief practices. I think it's also really helpful to help people appreciate that you don't have to set aside an hour a day to practice this. You could take two minutes out of your day here or there, and it's going to make an impact on your long-term health and well-being. I'm curious for all of you, what are you doing to unwind, relax? Like what's not on this list that should be on the list? I think the list says it all. <laughs> Except you didn't add wine, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wine kind of wonderful. Relax. <laughs> Christine, you had mentioned one gardening. Gardening, yes, yeah. Get, getting my fingers in the dirt really helps me. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, oh, go ahead. I was, you know, and then people think then therefore that I'm good at it and I'm not really, but I just, even, even weeding makes me happy. Go figure. <laughs> well, you can come over and make yourself happy in my yard at any point. There's lots of weeding to do. Absolutely. Um, nature, right? There, there are mm -hmm. studies done that look at our cortisol levels when we step out the door and they drop, right? So cortisol is a stress chemical that our brain naturally produces. Quite literally, being in nature is therapeutic. We're designed to be in nature. So I hope this list just kind of starts to stimulate your own thinking about how you can start to work in some of these basic relaxation skills without being an expert on mindfulness. You have the tools that you need already. One of the most simple skills that I do like to teach, um, and it is, it is free, it is easy, it is portable, and that is diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, it can be called a lot of things, belly breathing, deep breathing, focused breathing, relaxed breathing, abdominal breathing. You'll hear it called all those different terms. Uh, the diaphragm is a muscle, a pretty large muscle that sits below our lungs, kind of underneath our rib cage. Let's see if I can kind of show you. I'm not sure if I'm going to be tall enough, but if I put my hand here, and if you take your hand and you push it in a little bit underneath your rib cage, 
you can almost feel like air kind of gets pushed up and out of you. That diaphragm controls our lungs. You can think of it as the bellows of our lungs. When we are chronically stressed, there's some changes that happen in our breathing. We tend to engage in thoracic breathing. So that is breathing where we're using the upper part of our lungs only. By shifting and really engaging our diaphragm to fully inflate and deflate our lungs, by slowing our breathing down, we actually reduce our fight and flight response. Um, there's a nerve that kind of acts as a super highway uh, up into our brain to our autonomic nervous system, which is uh, the part of our nervous system that regulates our ability to fight, flight, flee, or to rest and digest. And by engaging the diaphragm, you're actually stimulating the tone or the engagement of the vagus nerve. So you're sending signals directly into the brain when you practice diaphragmatic breathing, telling your brain to relax. So you're helping to bring down the fight or flight response and bring up the rest, digest, and relaxation response. And there is a lot of research that regular practice of diaphragmatic breathing has a whole host of mental health, physical health, and cognitive health benefits. Um, it's very easy to teach. I would say the only caveat is um, for people who do have breathing problems, they can still practice it, but it might require some adaptation, as well as certain individuals who anxiety might increase when they focus either on their breathing or on their bodily sensations. Um, some people who have experienced physical trauma find it very difficult to focus on their body. And so that can provoke uh, an anxiety response for them. So we are going to practice some diaphragmatic breathing. So I'd like you to take one hand and put it on your chest. Take the other hand and put it on your diaphragm. <laughs> now, I'm gonna actually experiment a little bit and have us do some thoracic shallow breathing first. So be aware that if you choose to do this, you might feel a little uncomfortable. You might feel a little lightheaded, a little dizzy. You might notice some other changes in your body. So if you prefer not to, you don't have to do this practice, uh, but I do find it's a helpful one for teaching someone the difference in breathing types. So to start off with, we're just gonna breathe really fast and shallow. I want you to see if you can just get that upper hand to move, keeping that lower hand still. Whew. Even 10 breaths ooh, can precipitate sudden changes. Like it's remarkable what happens when we do that. And many times we're actually breathing that way without even realizing it. So the stress response is getting elevated, but we want to counteract it. And so now we're going to work the other way. I'd like you to try to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. As you breathe out, you're going to purse <clears throat> your lips together to create just a little bit of pressure. In, out. And you're going to slow your breathing down just a little bit. It shouldn't feel uncomfortable. It shouldn't feel like you're gasping for breath, but rather that you're easing the tension in your body. In, Pause, out. Pause, in. So 
So I invite you to continue to breathe deeply. You'll know you're using your diaphragm when you feel your lower hand rise up with your inhale and down with your exhale. Breathing in, breathing out. You could even push your hand just a little bit as you breathe out in order to start waking that diaphragm up. Keep breathing nice and deeply. You might have already automatically closed your eyes. It can make it a little easier to focus. Give yourself a few moments to fully breathe in and out with your diaphragm engaged. If your mind wanders, that's okay. That is what our minds are designed to do. Just gently bring your attention back to your breath. And when you're ready, let's come back out, gently shifting your attention to the space around you. How are you all feeling? <laughs> Much better. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so this is truly the most basic technique. Like if you're only going to teach one, this is the one to teach. Breath work is the foundation for all other relaxation and mindfulness skills. Now with a true mindfulness practice, we don't actually change the rate of our breathing, but I find for really helping to promote relaxation, doing mindfulness-based stress reduction, that it is helpful to slow down the pace of breathing. Um, there are a myriad of different breathing practices. If you are familiar with one that works for you, then you could, of course, teach that. For example, uh, there's a four, seven, eight count where you breathe in on four, hold on seven, breathe out on eight. There's what's called, called box breathing, where your inhale, hold, exhale, hold are all the same seconds. So it might be four seconds in, four seconds hold, four seconds out, four seconds hold, four seconds in. You can experiment what works for you. I usually encourage people when I'm coaching them to just find the pace that they like best. Um, again, when you're teaching it, like we started off, I like to do a little observation and have them experiment with that thoracic breathing versus the diaphragmatic breathing. I will talk just briefly about what the diaphragm is and how it regulates our stress response. I might not even mention the vagus nerve. It really depends on how deep you wanna go. Practice, practice, practice. That's the really important part. And then afterward, have them make some observations of what they noticed about their experience. For example, Christine felt markedly more relaxed afterward. 
<laughs> By doing that, you're also really having them kind of increase their self-awareness and their ability to self-monitor. These are some more aids, a uh, uh, couple video tutorials, one on how to do some different types of diaphragmatic breathing. It is easy to first do it lying down. Uh, in, if you're in a group, that might be a little hard to do. Then there's a standing practice and then a sitting practice. And then the people on healthcare meditation is actually a guided medica meditation doing diaphragmatic breathing. So once people learn, they can follow through and practice on their own. And again, as you can see, you don't need to be an expert in this. Um, you can use all of these great aids to help facilitate the group. So we're gonna go through one more. This is probably the second most common relaxation skill that I use. It is guided imagery. And I'll, I'll get a little nerdy here. I will say that guided imagery is one of my most favorite from like a brain functioning perspective because what you're going to do is help people to build a very positive, relaxing mental image. And you're gonna use all five senses. So super cool fact about the brain is that when we imagine experiencing something, our brain lights up as if we are actually experiencing that thing. So for example, if you were to imagine yourself riding a bike, the little motor cortex of your brain is gonna light up as if you're actually riding a bike. So this is a brain hack. You're fooling your brain into thinking that you're actually experiencing these amazing, relaxing sensations. Um, people who do guided imagery uh, have been shown to increase their alpha brain waves, which uh, help us to feel more relaxed. Like deep breathing, this is free. Our imagination is free. It is simple. It is easy. Um, one thing to be aware of is that not everyone has a mind's eye. There's actually a condition called aphantasia where people don't visualize things in their mind. So in that case, you might encourage a person to imagine writing a description of a relaxing experience or simply focusing on a positive, relaxing sensation, like imagining um, a sensation of warmth expanding through their body. So that way, if they don't have that visual mind's eye, they can still engage in the activity. And I've also found that when people are picking out their happy place to relax, it's helpful to avoid something that might have like a potential negative association. So sometimes people will go to the past, they might think of their past self before an injury, and that can, can trigger um, some difficult emotions. So really the only rule here in doing guided imagery is that this imaginal place should be 100% relaxing. So we are going to visit our own happy place. I again invite you to close your eyes, sitting in a nice, relaxed position, taking a moment to find your breath. And now imagine that you are in a safe, relaxing place. This could be any place, a place from your past or a completely imaginary place. You might be walking down a path in the woods, sitting on the beach, or even floating on a cloud. Imagine what you see as you look around you. What do you see nearby? And what do you see far away? What is below you, above you, or to the sides?
As you continue to look around this safe, relaxing place, imagine what you can hear both near you and far away. Maybe the sound of wind or waves or the voices of people you love. Continue to breathe deeply and imagine what you can touch. Perhaps you can feel the ground underneath you. Is the air around you warm or cool? Is it dry or heavy with rain? You might reach out to something near you and imagine the sensation underneath your hand. Imagine how you're taking in a deep breath, focusing on the scent as it fills your lungs. Take another deep breath, breathing in that smell and allowing your body to relax. Finally, imagine what you can taste. Maybe you're tasting your favorite food or drink, or you could just run your lips or your tongue over your lips and imagine what you taste in the air. Take a moment longer to allow your five senses to be completely alive in this safe, relaxing place. Take one more deep breath. And breathe out and bring your attention back out again. Welcome back. What did you observe about your experience as you went to your happy place? I want to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was you can always go back. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, the power of imagination is truly phenomenal. So the yes. more that you practice this, quite literally, the more you are strengthening the neural network in your mind. So the easier it comes to pull it up. And then the more profound your relaxation response will be. You're creating a behavioral conditioned response. Image, relax. I, so I frequently, is... I was going to say, I, I frequently use a beach scene, you know, because that's my favorite place to be. And, you know, um, sometimes I've been able to, to actually, you know, taste the salt in the air, you know, or I feel like I almost can, you know, just that close to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, your brain can. Again, it's such a profound brain hack. So this is a, a, a pretty straightforward one to teach people. Again, I'll start with a, a, just discussing a little bit about that brain hack and uh, why we want to use our five senses, then lead them through the practice, then have them do a little debriefing. These are some good resources. The Very Well Mind is an informational web page 
Um, Johns Hopkins, this is a video on guided imagery. And then there's also a link to a guided imagery script. So you don't have to remember what to say. You could lead the group by just reading through the script. So there's always a question of like, how much is enough? All right, what is the dose that we want to take to see all of those really good uh, body and health benefits that I mentioned earlier? Um, fortunately, like a little bit actually goes a really long way. The caveat is in order to keep the gains, you've got to keep the practice going. Um, so there is some research that's been done that looks at kind of the dose and effect. And um, this is one particular study and there's been similar results that shows actually a relatively brief practice of about 10 minutes twice a day, six days a week over the course of two weeks. This study used uh, something called a body scan and then diaphragmatic breathing and that that reduced subjective stress, anxiety and depression. So what I'm coaching someone, what I usually say is to start off with twice a day, maybe it's as short as three or five minutes a time. That can be particularly important if someone has difficulty maintaining focus. Um, what I usually find though, is that once people get engaged in it, they just wanna keep doing it. Or they'll find a video and maybe that's a 10, 15 minute uh, meditation and then they'll just repeat that one. Uh, but you've got to do it like anything. It takes practice. So I do emphasize this, that, that people need to keep at it. This isn't just kind of one pill that you're going to take and it's going to fix your stress level. You got to do it very regularly in order to get the benefits. So we are right about at our time. We'll go ahead and skip this. Uh, but after we get off the line, I would encourage you to practice one more mindful moment which is to write down three things that you are grateful for. Doing this practice can also really have a huge impact on your stress and your health. Our brains are wired to pay attention to what's wrong. So sometimes we need to give them a little nudge to pay attention to all the good and well, to all the things we're grateful for. And I, I'm grateful for Christine for inviting me <laughs> to this presentation today. And I'm grateful that you responded <laughs> and, and did it. <laughs> if you want to take a deeper dive, these are the references. So happy to talk through any questions, comments, concerns on how you can use these skills to guide a group or even an individual who you're working with. Well, let's hey, do a confidence Javier, check. Javier, I'm glad you were able to make it. <laughs> I just ran home uh, from my office for this. Thank you. So where's everyone's confidence at now? What is your confidence level that you could teach some of these skills to a group? I think my confidence is still the same, <laughs> but I I enjoy receiving it rather than teaching it. I, I do take a breathing technique um, class. It's not a class. It's something uh, that I'm involved with on TikTok, a woman who does it. And it's similar to what you just did. And it helps with the stress and mindfulness but I still don't feel comfortable teaching it because you do it so well. And I, I think that if I do it long enough, maybe it will improve, but um, I enjoy doing it. <laughs> I wonder what it would take that to bump that confidence level up for you. Um, taking it more, just, just practicing it more. There you go. Yes. I think that the materials that you've provided will help because it gives you some real good guidelines rather than trying Absolutely. to have to make it up, you know? Um, okay. I mean, cause, cause same thing. I've, I've been guided through it before and, and that's really helpful, but to guide somebody else, it's, 
uh, I would think that especially for the first time or the first couple of times, having a script already, um, you know, available uh, can give you that confidence to that confidence, make absolutely. it through and, and not leave it, something essential so, out. <laughs> she made it look so easy and was, you know, just it felt so good. I'm like, oh, my gosh, if I could do this every day. <laughs> <laughs> and you can. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> So find uh, find some guinea pigs, find some lucky friends and family who you can practice with, oh, uh, you know, get a group together and say, hey, I want to work on these skills. Will you all go on a little journey with me? Good idea. Yes. Well, I am happy to answer any questions uh, you are welcome to reach out to me in the future uh, christine as you pass along the slides please uh, pass along my email as well okay. i will also mm -hmm. drop it in the chat here there you go um and I welcome being a resource uh, to help you with your learning and, and your practice. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for, for this. I think it's been a great session. <laughs> um, these, the, this, today's um, meeting, as well as the ones from earlier this week will be, um, uh, we will post them and, and let you know where to find them. Um, and for those who participated today, we're going to be sending out, you know, our usual, you know, tell us what you think, give us a, a rating and, <laughs> you know, um, and um, also look for any suggestions for future um, events that we'll have or, or, or future, uh, you know, the, the quarterly check-ins that we do, um, you know, let us know what topics you might be interested in uh, for the future. Yeah, I forgot to... Uh... The, well, I had a I have a group usually around this time, and I just uh, ended it early and and uh, for a, a fish, anyways. Um, and I forgot about the other session. We're going to be always at twelve. Uh, well, we we had uh, on Tuesday. This was the last one of the week. Um, right. So on uh, Tuesday it was uh, I did something on the you know some of the logistics and of uh, and and. Um, mechanics.